Buenos dias. Thank you again for the wonderful uh, introduction. I'm going to start off today's presentation as a continuation of the discussion that I ended yesterday's session with. Today I will go into additional detail about the work that we do at the Congressional Budget Office, an independent support service of the U.S. Congress. So we'll discuss cost estimating, a general uh, discussion. The first slide is a diagram of the legislative process and CBO's role, the Congressional Budget Office's role, within that legislative process. So you see with the blue box, and by the way, again, this slide is available in Spanish within your folder, if you'd like to follow along. You see within the blue box, uh, this is just a general uh, flow of a piece of legislation or a bill. A bill is introduced by Congress. At that time, the Congressional Budget Office will provide informal assistance to Congress about the potential cost estimating or cost effects that may occur if the draft bill were, or if the bill were in, uh, introduced uh, or implemented, pardon me. If the bill were implemented, what effects would, might occur on the budget? So we do an informal estimate at that time. Once the bill is introduced, it can then be considered by full committee, at which time by law, CBO is required to provide a formal cost estimate, which I'll discuss uh, in more detail later on. The formal cost estimate is to make, uh, be made public and is published on our website and is used within a report for the bill that is considered by a committee. And lastly, a bill can be considered on the floor. At that time, we're not required to do any more formal cost estimates, but we can provide additional estimates for any amendments that might be made to that bill on an informal level. We might also publish that information on our website. But we'll just publish a table of our estimates, not a full explanation, as we would do for a formal cost estimate that has been considered out of committee. Next slide. So I'll go into the basics of CBO's estimate. First, what is a cost estimate exactly? You can click again just to, thank you. It's a concise story about the legislation's budgetary impact, if enacted. Basically, it answers the question of what effect would it have on our deficit? Would it increase or worsen our deficit, or would it decrease our deficit? It assesses the impact of legislation relative to current law. And again, let me uh, emphasize that this impact is strictly a budgetary impact. We do not look, and there have been, of course, questions or uh, interest in looking at this, but we do not uh, look at the social impact from the legislation. We just look at the money. Uh, so an assessment of the impact of legislation relative to current law, it's required for each bill that has been reported out of full committee. It's required by law. CBO staff prepares thousands of informal cost estimates in a given year. So these aren't the formal cost estimates, but informal cost estimates might happen at various, uh, at various periods of the life of a legislation or piece of legislation. It can happen before a bill has been introduced. It can just be draft language, and it can be um, a confidential uh, informal estimate that we would provide to Congress. CBO, um, so, and then some informal uh, estimates are confidential, as I just mentioned. Next slide, please. So, 
in terms of numbers, we provide 500 to 700 formal cost estimates in a given year, which are published on our website. We do an estimate for five to 10 years over the projection window. Um, and uh, it's done for bills that have been approved out of committee. We provide an explanation for our formal cost estimates between one to 10 pages, which provide, as I'll talk about later on in the presentation, um, an, an overview of our assumptions uh, that we've used, uh, information that we've used, historical information, and our resources, where we actually received the information, which I'll talk about later as well. It's usually from the agency directly. So, looking at the starting point, what do we measure our effects against? As I mentioned yesterday in the presentation, uh, we have a baseline that we produce three times a year. Starting in January, we prepare our initial baseline, and this is again a snapshot of uh, current law to remain unchanged what the budget would look like 10 years out into the future. When we do our cost estimates, we measure what the impact of this legislation would be relative to that baseline. Our estimates also reflect the most economic, uh, the most recent economic forecasts, which we produce within the Congressional Budget Office with the advice of economists outside of CBO. We have a economic advisors panel uh, that um, assists us in, in doing our forecasts. Um, after the starting point for a year, um, let's see, let me go down, service and neutral costs. I think I've got all of it. Um, CBO's cost estimates show how revenues and spendings would change, again, relative to the benchmark. Next slide, thank you. Process for developing our cost estimates. We've got two uh, key processes that are involved. First is the research and analysis. And secondly is communicating this information to Congress and to the public at large. The research and analysis part, I'm just going to go through uh, on the left hand side. We carefully review legislation to assess how it would change current law including the types of budgetary effects. This first um, step is extremely key and essential. Uh, we must understand, first of all, current law and what the current programs look like. And then we have to understand what the legislation is trying to do. Sometimes we must find the advice of our general counsel or our lawyers to help further explain what the law or what the legislation would do relative to current law. And actually, as Justin had mentioned yesterday, uh, the way that the legislation is written is key. If the legislation is very broad and general, which gives leeway to the executive branch or the agencies and how they would implement the legislation, in terms of how we would do our cost estimates, uh, it would also leave a lot of leeway and room for us to interpret and look at the legislation in a certain way. So this is where it's very key um, for CBO um, and Congress. We can work together um, in uh, understanding better what the legislation, if it's not written in a way that is very clear, to understand uh, what the budgetary effects might be and to clearly state what the intent of the bill uh, would be. And this helps Congress in, uh, in developing or further um, improving uh, legislative language. To determine the key factors that affect the budgetary outcomes is the next step. So once we understand what current law um, is, is, and then we understand what the legislation is attempting to do, then we have to understand the individuals that would be affected. We have to understand um, the usage, utilization of the new program potentially that was created or would be created under the legislation. And we would have to understand the costs. Um, I'm, I'm just giving a broad 
if it's an additional benefit, for example, that's being provided, we would have to understand the cost per beneficiary. We obtain timely and balanced information from a variety of sources and experts. So now that we have an idea of what our model is to look like, um, what factors we need to gather information um, regarding, then we would seek out the appropriate entities outside of CBO and within CBO as well. We have experts at CBO that do work in various areas of the budget. And we would uh, try to obtain as much information as possible, historical information, to help us to build our models. And finally, we quantify the estimated impact on the federal budget by developing models using statistical resources, uh, using Excel spreadsheets, and other means to build our models. And then finally, we communicate this information. We write a clear and concise explanation of the estimated budgetary effects. We describe the key components and inputs in our write-up, it is important to note that we do not make any recommendations as to the merits or whether the legislation should be enacted or passed. That is not included. That's not our role. And we anticipate further questions that might come from Congress and the public at large. Next. The write-up for a typical formal cost estimate includes a summary highlighting the major provisions of the bill, an estimate section, which contains a table of uh, over a 10-year window of our estimates, and our basis of our estimate, which includes uh, the assumptions that we use, and key data that we've used, the resources where we've obtained this data from, and the components of the estimate. Next slide, please. So Congress uses our estimates um, to make sure they are meeting certain congressional rules. Um, again, there are PAYGO um, is one thing where, uh, for example, if uh, the legislation we've estimated would have an increase um, in spending, they must find an offsetting decrease in spending or increase in revenue. So they use our estimates um, to make sure that they are uh, meeting their rules and their, their budgetary goals, which means we do not provide a range for our estimate. We actually provide point estimates. Since we provide a point estimate, statistically, it means that our estimate has to be at the very midpoint. Um, basically, the estimate uh, of the bill is a 50% chance of being even greater or even less than the estimate that we provide. We try to reach that midpoint. Our explicit, we are as explicit as possible about the uncertainties within our estimate for various reasons. How a bill will actually be implemented, uh, as I keep bringing up Justin, as he had mentioned, can be very much so up to uh, the executive branch in writing the regulations for that bill. So, for a general bill, if it's not quite clear how Congress, uh, if Congress is not clear, explicit, explicitly clear in uh, how they would like the bill to be implemented, then the, then the executive branch has leeway to write regulations that would uh, allow them to implement the bill in a more freer way can't explain that, um, than might have been intended by Congress. Um, that would impact our estimate. Um, we might interpret the bill, uh, we being Congressional Budget Office, might interpret the bill to be implemented one way, um, and it might be implemented in a totally different way um, if it's enacted. That could affect our estimate, and that is a, a level of uncertainty that we try to express as well. Our, our estimates are based on uh, data from public information, objective uh, sources, 
which uh, can be the agency, but we keep in mind that the agency might have it, its own agenda in uh, whether a legislation is enacted or not. Um, we try to have a balanced perspective and quantitative analysis. Next slide, please. How CBO does its analysis. I've mentioned most of this uh, before, but I'll just run through it. The resources used for our cost estimates include experts and analysts in the federal, state, or local agencies. Uh, I specifically, as was mentioned in my bio, I work on veterans health care, trade, and international food assistance. So for my estimates, I refer to the Department of Veterans Affairs. I also refer to the Department of State and the Department of Agriculture for data that I use for estimates related to veterans health care, trade, and international food assistance. We obtain historical data and experience for programs that already exist or activities to base our estimates for new programs that do not exist. Since there is no historical data for the new programs, we have to use something that already exists as a proxy. We use spreadsheets and simulation models. Uh, data and information can be publicly available or provided specifically at CBO's request. By law, CBO is able to request information from the agencies and departments. CBO also purchases data or collects or tabulates um, or tabulated data from the private sources as well. We do this for larger bills. Thank you. So constructing and reviewing models. Inputs in, re uh, in understanding what the legislation will do um, include reviews of research literature, Again, historical data from federal programs, original research using administrative records and survey data, analysis by the staff of Joint Committee on Taxation. This is another congressional uh, office that provides information on taxes or revenue. We do brainstorming in-house. One thing that is wonderful about CBO is that it has a very collegiate atmosphere and even for individuals that work outside of our specialty or our specific area of the budget, we can work with them to gather information and to brainstorm and kind of uh, understand models that they have worked on. Uh, so it's a very collegiate atmosphere. And there's an extensive internal review. One question that was asked by my colleagues on our way here was, how do individuals at CBO who have partisan views of their own not insert these partisan views into their estimates? Well, we are human. But there's a way that we've worked around this, and that's with an extensive overview or a review process within CBO. For every formal cost estimate, there is at least three levels of review that go all the way up to the director of CBO to ensure that our estimates are as sound, as unbiased as possible. We also have external resources, research organizations, government agencies, private sector organizations and associations. I have to give a note or a disclaimer that again, when we collect this information from the outside, we also have to consider that each agency or each organization or entity might have their own separate agenda. And we don't want to make we want to make sure that we are not including biased information into our estimates. So we factor that in as well. We also have our CBO's panel of economic advisors, as I mentioned. Next slide. Uh, as mentioned, just briefly, we do point estimates. We do not give ranges for our estimates. We do the midpoint of the range, and we are explicit about our uncertainties. Next slide, please. For every estimate that is published by CDL, we have to go through an extensive internal review. 
we have to justify our estimates to our boss, our boss's boss, and the director, at least those three levels. Um, we have written explanations that are thoroughly critiqued and edited, and in some cases, outside experts review key assumptions before estimates are released. Next slide. So, CPO is full of um, very bright people <laughs> that uh, are used to research and are used to writing in very technical, uh, in a very technical manner. Um, but we ensure that for our cost estimates, that they're written in a uh, user-friendly manner. Uh, so we make sure that our estimates are written that, in a way that is accessible to the general public and non-specialized audience, so we don't use very technical terms. Or if we do, we try to uh, define those terms in our estimates. We provide context about what the topic is about. Again, we assume that even though Congress and the Budget Committee is our primary client at the Congressional Budget Office, we provide this information to the general public, um, to the general U.S. citizen, or anybody that's uh, interested. And we want to make sure that we explain the topic in a way that you can start at a very base level and understand what the legislation does, what current law um, looks like, and how we came up with our estimate. Uh, we try to leave no gaps in logic um, or arguments, and we try to use tables, graphs, and figures to help illustrate our point. Next slide, please. There's a nice quote from Mark Twain. Less is more. If I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. <laughs> we try not to be uh, too wordy. Um, in our cost estimates, because people get bored, as you might be getting bored right now. <laughs> Thank you. So we keep our cost estimates short and concise, which is an art form in itself. I'm just, I have a, a couple of examples of cost estimates. Um, I'm just going to run through them very briefly. So there is a cost estimate for emergency unemployment benefits or insurance in the U.S. For individuals that have been unemployed for a given amount of time, certain individuals that have been unemployed for a given amount of time, the U.S. provides unemployment benefits. There was a piece of legislation that would expand those unemployment benefits for a longer period of time after an individual has been unemployed. We had to do a cost estimate for this. Um, so we had to do an analysis. Uh, and again, this analysis uh, looks first at what is the caseload of these individuals. Looking at the current baseline or current law, how many individuals use unemployment benefits now? And then what would happen if the legislation were passed? Additional individuals would use unemployment benefits and for a longer period of time. So we had to gather data to figure out what those two factors would be. And then we had to think about, on average, how much does an individual collect in unemployment benefits and apply that to our model. Next slide, please. So, uh, and this was actually my colleague who has um, actually come before, Christy, uh, who had, had uh, visited uh, last year. This was an estimate she worked on. Um, and she gathered information by uh, going to the Department of Labor, which provided her information on the number of claims for unemployment benefits, the ex exhaustion rates for the regular benefit levels, uh, basically how long are people using these benefits, and the average weekly benefit. A model was applied, basically, very simple uh, arithmetic multiplication here, um, applying, you know, multiplying the number of users, uh, how long they've used it, 
um, and then the cost per week. Simple, uh, simple arithmetic. But this is just an example. Next slide, please. And then a little bit more uh, difficult example is uh, oil royalty uh, relief. Um, basically, uh, for uh, companies that are extracting oil um, in the U.S., they have to pay a percentage of the relief to the U.S. government. Uh, this legislative proposal basically said, uh, if you, if they were unable to, um, if oil, pardon me, if oil prices uh, dropped below twelve dollars a barrel, they would not have to pay um, these royalties. So now we have to think in terms of statistics or the probability that the oil um, prices would drop. So this took a little bit more um, uh, of an analysis in, in looking at probability and we used out sort of outside resources to, to determine this estimate. Uh, next slide. I think, I think we're done. I just didn't want to go over my time too much. Uh, in summing up, uh, cost estimating is fundamentally three stages. Two of those stages are on the same side as I talked about before, the research and analysis, and then the communication. Um, it's always important to be clear. There is no single approach that works for all estimates. There's not some magic model that we have for all estimates. And it's good to be humble and understand that we're not going to be 100% all the time accurate, but we strive to, to provide the, the best estimate that we can within the given time frame. And I now open up my uh, presentation for any questions that you might have. Thank you. Buenos días, en Fernández Portugal, Secretario Técnico de Comisiones. Eh, la, el trabajo que realizan, eh, ¿lo hacen a pedido del comité o ustedes lo hacen apenas si un proyecto de oficio, o sea, sin consultarle a nadie, o, o el comité le pide que haga el análisis? Esa es la pregunta. Thank you for your question. So uh, we are, by law, required to do formal cost estimates for every bill that has been reported or approved by a full committee. However, uh, we do not do cost estimates for every introduced bill. <clears throat> Pardon me. That would be a lot of estimates. Um, however, uh, Congress might ask, uh, request, that we provide an informal cost estimate for a bill that has been introduced, at which case we will do the estimate at that time. We, again, only are required to do cost estimates, formal cost estimates, for bills that have been approved out of full committee. <clears throat> it's important to note that uh, it, the bill doesn't have to be introduced. For, a, uh, for Congress to request an estimate. Many times, they request estimates of bills, informal estimates, before a bill is introduced. It could be draft language. It can be an idea. It can be a proposal. <clears throat> Depending on our time and our workload, we try to get back to uh, Congress with an estimate, an informal estimate, with an understanding that that informal estimate is confidential. We do not publish this estimate that's informal, and we do not share this estimate with anybody else in Congress unless they can produce and share with us that exact draft language. Voy a hacer una pregunta. Eh, ¿Quiere decir que los proyectos de ley que se presentan no vienen con estimado de costos? O sea, no hay en el proyecto que se presenta 
un fundamento del de costo que podría tener o si viene So, no, the bill does not have to have a cost estimate at the time that it is filed. It is only required to have a cost estimate at the time that it is reported by full committee. So, the reports that Justin referred to yesterday of each bill that is approved at a full committee includes a run by, a paragraph by, or a section by section um, brief or summary of the bill. It provides views and it also provides estimates. That is a requirement by law that all reports of a bill include a CBO cost estimate. However, some congressional members, uh, if they are trying to have a committee um, look or review or uh, uh, consider a bill that they've introduced. Sometimes the committee will ask for a CBO co an informal CBO cost, cost estimate to accompany the bill to ensure that the budgetary effects from that bill are minimal to zero. U.S. Congress considers 9,000 bills introduced, introduced bills in a given year. The sheer workload that would be involved from doing cost estimates, even at an informal level, would be much more than CBO is capable of. Keep in mind that without even doing a, an informal cost estimate for every introduced bill, CBO is still producing thousands of cost estimates in a given year, informal cost estimates in a given year. I myself do hundreds of informal cost estimates in a given year. Buenos días, Boris Mauricio de Participación Ciudadana. Una, bueno, hay una parte que también interesa para el gasto del Congreso con respecto a la consultoría sobre estudios de costo. ¿no? Entonces quería saber más o menos cuánto gasta el Congreso de Estados Unidos ¿no? en este tipo de consultoría. Y, y también, por otro lado, hay mucha controversia en, en el republicanos y demócratas sobre la política de salud. ¿no? Y si usted en su experiencia ha logrado ver algún proyecto ¿no? con este estudio de costos respecto a, a el gobierno anterior de Obama. Gracias. Uh. Regarding your, thank you for your first question. Regarding your first question, uh, the appropriations or funding that's provided to CBO in a given year is about $46 million. That $46 million represents the salaries and wages for about 235 staff members and the level of staff members depends on that appropriations. The bulk of our money is for salaries. Our request for funding each year depends, as I mentioned yesterday, depends on the type of work that we do, 
right now there is a major focus, as to your second question, on health care reform. We also have been looking at a dynamic analysis or the macroeconomic effects or economic effects that might happen from legislation with substantial budgetary costs. And of course, we are working on improving our models. In regards to your second question, my portfolio or the area of the budget that I work on is specifically for veterans health care which believe it or not is outside the purview or outside the realm of Obamacare also known as ACA however uh, you may have seen there's been recent news about the work that my colleagues have done and that an estimate that was released in a report a couple of days ago shows that 14 million U.S. citizens would lose health care if the reform proposed by the House were enacted. Um, there are at least 20 analysts working on bills related to repeal or to reform the Health Care Act. Uh, this is part of the staffing increase that I discussed. There are various entitlement programs that would be affected, but there are also other programs across uh, the budget that would have indirect effects as well. I. I can't speak to those specific estimates. I can speak somewhat to the process. But it is definitely a collaborative effort that has included external reviews as well. And, and has been going on for some time at an informal level. Sí, buenos días. Usted señala en el proceso de análisis que realizan que una de las fuentes, eh, digamos una de las fuentes de información que ustedes utilizan para el proceso de investigación es la que proviene de las entidades públicas involucradas en lo que podría ser la iniciativa legislativa. Sí. Eh, en la medida de lo posible, usted señala que utilizan fuentes públicas, pero me gustaría saber si existe alguna norma que obligue a las entidades a proporcionar esa información a ustedes para ponerla a disposición del Congreso allí cuando el, la información pública no sea suficiente. Thank you for your question. Uh, yes, by law, the federal agencies and departments are required to provide information to the Congressional Budget Office, or CBO, to assist us in completing our estimates. There is not legislation or statute that requires a private entity to provide information to CBO. That would be considered a, a mandate, <clears throat> um, a private sector mandate. There is no mandate requiring a company, a private company, or entity to provide information to us. I'm, I'm going to be quite blunt <laughs> that even with the statute for federal agencies to provide information to us, 
there can be a level of, of obstruction and a level of difficulty in obtaining information from these agencies within a given time and reliable information. I'm going to be quite honest. The agency I work with, the Veterans Healthcare or Veterans Department, uh, has been widely known for having unreliable data at times. In fact, it was a major scandal a few years ago. Because of this, we had to be, and we have to be very cautious and aware of the information that they're providing us. And it allows for us to have an open conversation with the agency to understand any limitations of the data that they may be providing us. And to note those limitations in the estimates that we provide. And it's, it's been noted that if an agency does not provide the data and information to us, that they may be penalized by the Appropriations Committee or the amount of funding they receive in the following year. So the agency definitely would want to provide the information. But it doesn't speak to when they provide us the information the extent of information they provide us and the reliability of that information, unfortunately. Buenos días. Este, para hacer proyecciones o análisis económico, utilizamos generalmente indicadores de análisis costo-beneficio o costo-efectividad, según los casos. Pregunta, la CBO ¿Tiene una metodología eh, le, este, autorizada formalmente o crea programas especiales para cada estimación del proyecto de ley? no general model for the estimates that we provide. Um, every piece of legislation is different. So it is up to the analyst to come up with a model based on what the legislation is requiring or allowing for an agency to do. There are some pieces of legislation that are similar to previous bills that we've reviewed before. In which case, we can base our estimate off of an existing model. But there is no magic model out there that can estimate every piece of, of legislation. I wish there were. <laughs> it would make things easier. <laughs> but, but no. But it would also make things not as fun. I think I, I need to note that a lot of the analysts at CBO, it's, it's a puzzle. It is, it is coming up with an estimate on your own, which is the analytical side is extremely engaging and interesting. And I think it, it takes a certain beast or a certain person to, to work at CBO and enjoys that type of analysis. Hola. Este, eh, quería hacerte, digamos, he tenido la oportunidad de revisar eh, eh, la noticia que eh, referiste hace un par de días sobre que 14 personas perderían su, la cobertura, que fue el punto de, este, sobre la cual la metodología del informe se basó. La cobertura de salud en la cual 14 millones de personas este, perderían esto con la aplicación del, del plan de salud del presidente Trump. Pero en el 2014, ustedes hicieron otro reporte donde indicaban que 2.3 millones de personas 
eh, que tenían empleo, pero los de más bajos recursos, este, se verían afectados con el Obamacare. Entonces, eh, pregunto, sí. porque en el informe, como se apela a la precisión y no a la extensión, si dentro del análisis está la línea de comparación, porque se comparan unidades semejantes, ¿no? Si voy a hablar sobre la cobertura del de programa de, de salud del presidente Trump, tendría que comparar el, el, los temas de cobertura del Obamacare. Entonces, lo he visto más con el Medicaid que con el Obamacare en el, en el reporte. Entonces, quería ver si, si lo han tomado en cuenta, pero apelando a la precisión de los reportes, eso va hacia un segundo nivel de exploración a quien desee indagar dentro de ese informe. Mi segunda pregunta es, estos son modelos predictivos, algunos son economía, algunos son modelos espaciales que utilizan para proyectarse a potenciales situaciones. ¿Qué pasa acá en el Congreso del Perú? Te voy a explicar la, lo que sucede en el proceso legislativo. Casi no se hace, por no decir no se hace, eh, análisis predictivo. ¿Por qué? Porque hay un recurso que utiliza, eh, que es parte del, del, del procedimiento legislativo, que es pedir información a las entidades que tienen relación con la materia que se pretende legislar. Entonces, muchas veces se utiliza y se toma como eso, eh, como el insumo final que va a servir para el análisis posterior. Aquí no se produce información. Lamentablemente no se produce información, por lo cual, digamos, partimos de una premisa o una, este, o una eh, se podría decir, este, intencionalidad inicial de la persona que dese, desearía darte una parte de información que desea que tú conozcas, porque no tenemos una base de datos abiertos. Entonces, apelando a la pregunta que hizo nuestro amigo hace un momento, el análisis predictivo que ustedes realizan, este, que, digamos, acá buscamos, no tenemos herramientas informáticas, de, de, de econometría que nos permitan hacer eso. Algunos por aquí conocen de manera individual que existe el R, que existe el STATA, que existe el, el SPSS, ¿no? ¿Con qué modelo predictivo de econometría ustedes trabajan y que les brinda digamos, le da facilidades para hacer análisis económico-social. Uh, so, that was, uh, thank you for your question. Very, very loaded. <laughs> very loaded question. Um, and so I have to give a disclaimer. Um, again, I, I have personally have not worked on uh, the enactments or legislation of Obamacare, which took a very long period of time to develop. And I personally have not worked on the legislation that was uh, recently released to reform um, Obamacare, which was just developed. So I have to give the disclaimer. Um, but, but there are a few things I wanted to clarify within the statement that you provided. Um, first is that we do not predict. There's a difference between predicting and projecting. And our estimates are not predictions. They are projections of snapshots in time um, and what we expect would happen if no other changes happen to current law. That's why it cannot be a prediction. Because there will be changes that will influence our estimates that we have no idea of what those changes will be. Okay? So we just project, snapshot, the current law projecting. I think your question is speaking to unbiased objectivity and transparency. Uh, there's a concern, there's a, actually a statement or a phrase, a, an idea that uh, we think of at CBO, and I, I shared it with my colleagues, is that if we are upsetting both parties, both the majority and the minority, 
we're doing our job right. That we are not, we, uh, we again, try to provide information that won't cater to either party. So our estimates at time can ruffle or upset, ruffle feathers is an expression, or upset uh, a party because it might not suit their political agenda. This is the case with the legislation as it stands now. Just to give a little bit of background though, uh, in terms of uh, under Obamacare, what affected the increase, that 2.3 million that you were referring to, for lower income individuals, it dealt with a couple of key provisions in the bill, which was the expansion of Medicaid and the subsidies that would be provided under the health care program, under this new health care called, or uh, this new entity called exchanges. So these were key factors that contributed to our estimates of the population increase. I can't speak to the reform of health care, and I don't know if my colleagues can, of the changes that have been made in this most recent bill, but I am assuming that the decrease in health care might be, in the number of people, might be from a roll back of the benefits that were provided under Obamacare. Rolling back those benefits will decrease the size of the healthcare population, potentially, because more individuals will have higher out-of-pocket expenses. I don't know if that's absolutely correct. I haven't read the legislation, but that's just the idea of how our estimates are formed. So that's just a very general, general, general idea of what possibly could have happened. But again, this is my very preliminary assessment of legislation that I have not reviewed. <laughs> so, um, but again, uh, we pride ourselves with unbiased and transparent information. And sometimes that information we provide will upset one party or the other. Again, we gauge our work is whether we're evenly upsetting both parties. Nosotros teníamos el mismo problema en CBO en cuanto a información hasta el 2006 que decidió poner una ley obligando a que todas las entidades tengan obligación de darnos a nosotros información. En tiempo real y eh, de la manera como la comisión decía. Por lo tanto, ahí nosotros ya, cuando nosotros teníamos propuestas que tenían que ver con las naciones, nosotros teníamos información directamente de la entidad, independientemente de la uh, respuesta a los oficios que teníamos. Inclusive podíamos tener la solicitud de que nos den acceso directo a su base de datos. Eh, adicionalmente, Eh, hemos puesto posibilidades nosotros cuando vienen los ministerios a decir sus asignaciones ellos eh, tienen que traernos un análisis prospectivo que tienen como sistema de planeamiento que trabaja con ese plan donde tienen una prospectiva los próximos cinco años en su plan estratégico de desarrollo que es la tendencia y dos escenarios uno favorable y uno desfavorable y con las variables que podrían influir en cada uno de ellos. Eso nos hace que nosotros no, te, no tengamos una necesidad directa de información de la propia eh, aparato administrativo del Congreso. Básicamente trabajamos con información de las entidades, con sus análisis prospectivos, informes de planeamiento y cuando tenemos alguna duda, si sí hacemos... Eh, estimaciones propias para ver si esa información es verdadera. Ejemplo, este año ha venido el marco macroeconómico multianual, que es donde ve el déficit, eh, es difícil, cuando nos dicen cuál va a ser el déficit este año, hay una ley que establece ya cuánto debe ser el déficit antes del proyecto de ley, y hemos encontrado que no eran las estimaciones, eh, no, no daban el déficit que venía la norma, sino que teóricamente el déficit es mayor. 
pero nos faltó el tiempo suficiente como para hacer un análisis, nos faltaba un comité como oficina y eso nos falta un depende de una integración entre las diferentes comités que tengamos, tenemos para poder desarrollar. Pero sí tenemos un aparato normativo que nos permite tener la información sin tener un equipo de, de alto costo, que nos gustaría tenerlo, pero no tenemos las finanzas suficientes como para tener un equipo de tiempo. La pregunta es, ¿ustedes tienen una norma que define con, anteri con anterioridad el déficit, como el tenemos nosotros, o es que la definen ya en la asignación de los recursos? So, I, I want to be clear that there are different offices within the U.S. or there are different entities. So appropriations committee and the appropriators, those providing funds, are separate uh, than C separate um, from CBL, our Congressional Budget Office. We are just an advisory office, um, and the information that we are receiving, by law, um, is required from the executive branch or from the departments and agencies. But we are not necessarily kind of coexisting with the appropriations committee in the manner that I think that you've described. I don't know if I've clearly stated that. But the, the administration or the departments are required to provide a 10-year estimate of their budget or uh, the Office of Management and Budget. Actually, it's not 10 years, it's, it's five years. But they, they have been providing up to 10 years. And they provide this information to CBO. So we actually have access to the president's uh, baseline or estimate of what the budget would be by each program. And we can compare our estimates to the administration. Um, does that? But Congress is required to follow our estimates. And so there, it's a, a very important distinction, as my colleague had mentioned, um, the, the separation between the executive branch, the administration, and the legislative branch, uh, Congress. Congress uses the information provided by Congressional Budget Office. The executive branch uses the information provided by the Office of Management and Budget. However, the Office of Management and Budget does not do a cost estimate for legislation. That's not their role, their job. They don't do that because it's, that is in the world of Congress, right? That's what Congress is working on. They don't do estimates of legislation. What they do estimates for in the executive branch are proposals that they include within their budget every year. And CBO looks at those estimates of proposals and we come up with our own estimates of proposals. That actually is a discussion outside of um, the presentation that I've given today. That's another role that we have at CBO, outside of providing cost estimates of legislation. Okay. Gracias. Oh, I'm sorry. Este, este, muy buenos días. Mi nombre es, es este, Roberto Silva y trabajo en el área de sistemas. Veo la parte de lo que son los sistemas de información. La pregunta va con relación a la información. Nos explicaba que una etapa del proceso, digamos, para hacer, digamos, las proyecciones es buscar información. Y nos contabas que esa información ustedes la solicitan a los diversos sectores del gobierno, digamos, a los cuales ustedes tienen acceso y por ley tienen la obligación de darse. Sí. La pregunta es, digamos, vinculada de que a veces conseguir la información es complicado. Tengo entendido, según nos has, lo que nos has explicado, es que este, no existe, eh, digamos, una, un, una iniciativa actualmente que esté funcionando que consolide la información de todos los sectores, a fin de que ya no tengan ustedes que, digamos, pedir la información. Porque si tuvieran como un sistema centralizado de información, 
de todos los sectores, definitivamente el trabajo que ustedes harían sería mucho más rápido y tal vez hasta transparente. Sí. Existe, digamos, han evaluado, han pensado lo, lo valioso que sería contar con un sistema centralizado de la información de todos los sectores y si es que se han dado cuenta que es viable o no es viable. No sé si nos podrías contar algo sobre eso. Muchas gracias. That's an excellent question. That's an excellent question. Thank you for asking. Uh, so, a couple, three things. The agency, three things. The agency does provide information, various agencies do provide information on general data and statistics regarding the benefits they provide on their websites. So that's kind of general information that's provided to the public and information that we might use as well. So that's kind of a, a repository that, or a central place that you might be referring to in regards to, to, to data. Um, I also at CBO request the same data every year that I know that I'm going to absolutely need and so that is a, a um, automatic generation that I receive from, it's automatically generated uh, that I receive from, from the agency. However, we don't know what information we might need before we receive legislation. So there can't really be a, a place where they put this data because we don't know what data really is needed. Sometimes we need very specific data about a uh, population or subgroup that we didn't know we would have needed a month before. Um, so it, it can't really, I don't think logistically it would work. Um, to have a central place to put all of this data because the, our needs for data is constantly changing. Buenos dias. Um, so um, the House Republican Conference, which I work for, is um, chaired by, as mentioned, Kathy McMorris Rogers from Eastern Washington State. And um, the, this is a leadership office. So um, as I mentioned yesterday, you have the Speaker of the House, who is, um, and then you have the, the leader, then you have the whip, and then you have the conference chair. And the conference chair acts as the communications um, branch of leadership to talk about and discuss um, what is going on as far as the legislation and the policy that's going on in the House. And, and additionally, it acts as a PR firm, for lack of words, or a um, consulting firm for members on an individual basis so that they can speak directly to their constituents. So, um, so this is a, a very constituent and citizen-focused um, presentation. And without knowing your individual roles and responsibilities, I, I challenge you to Think of ways that you can incorporate some of these tactics into your own work, and I would love to discuss this um, during the question section in a way that might be more nationally focused, if that works better for you, or um, as you will notice, this is a very constituent, local focused presentation, so um, let's, we can discuss further ways that it can be more tailored to your individual needs. Um, so constituent services um, programs within the House of Rep Representatives, they're used to stay in contact with citizens. And this relationship um, informs legislative decisions, it informs um, our communication strategies, and it establishes, most importantly, trust and confidence in representative government. Next slide, go ahead, please. So, um, Using media to, commu to communicate with constituents. Whenever I say media um, in this capacity, I mean using um, the press, using television. So um, you must first identify a media strategy that works for you and your needs. 
um, and therefore you must meet your citizens wherever they are, their, your voters. Um, and this means what they're watching, um, what social media, or what um, television they're, they're consuming, and you need to um, understand who they are and what they are engaging in. And um, for, you know, if you're interacting with members of Congress, um, this can be personalized. For me, um, some members of Congress want to be on TV all the time. So we tailor strategies to, um, to you know, um, communicate what it is they want to communicate um, in that way. Some do not want to be on television, so we have to adapt those styles. Sometimes radio is a better fit, um, for instance. And so you also, whenever you're identifying this media strategy, you want to understand what kind of things you want to be discussing on television. And another thing to um, identify is that there, the difference between earned versus paid media. Earned media is being interviewed by um, correspondents, being, um, you know, talking about things that television networks are wanting to um, for you to talk about and to be broadcasting, whereas paid media um, is investing monetarily, um, you know, ads and, um, and putting money behind what it is you're talking about. Both are promotional and both are advertising. So um, whenever you are working with the media, the first step is to establish relationships with um, the networks, with your bookers, with your producers. Um, this involves pitching them on issues that are important to you and important to, to your, your boss or whoever is going to be on television. And um, you want to be um, work, creating a working relationship in a way that, um, that you, it's beneficial for both of you. Um, so this also, creating these, these beneficial relationships also means that they're going to be working in your favor, helping you out, giving you the questions that you're you're wanting before um, before your member of Congress goes on television. Um, to prepare for your interview, um, you're going to want to develop your messaging tactics before you get there, um, and you know this includes for topical issues and your legislative priorities. Um, you can also use digital media to communicate with your constituents through recorded videos and um, be pitching these to media outlets as well. Um, this is a great way to control the narrative. Um, it is important to educate your constituents on the work you're doing, where you stand on issues, and explain policy issues to your constituents in this way. Um, using this tool will help bolster your constituent service programs as well. Um, you can use it for list events, um, general video updates, etc. And talking about talking um, to your constituents is also a very important ta tactic. Um, for for example, this past year, um, or every year in the congressional calendar, August um, is a, a time whenever members of Congress go back to their districts for six weeks at a time and they are not in D.C. And, um, you know, oftentimes media can kind of go silent during these times, but um, House Republicans wanted to ensure that our members were engaged and um, staying on message. And for us, for someone, um, the, the House Republican con Conference, who's trying to coalesce our members and make sure that everyone is um, the Republican members are talking about the same things and staying, um, staying on topic, it was very important that we try to control the narrative while um, they weren't in D.C. and we couldn't physically be seeing them and coaching them every day. So what we did is we created a media strategy. Um, it was um, to bolster the Speaker of the House agenda and we created um, pamphlets that they took home with them. We, um, coach them to be all talking about this agenda, so that way um, we could control the narrative um, remotely. Next slide. Social media. Social media is um, it's really one of the greatest communications um, developments since the printing press. Um, it allows you to tell us your story in a very authentic and intimate way where you can interact with other members of your party and your delegation, you can interact with outside groups, and you can reach people you ultimately wouldn't reach 
Um, for us and the um, Republican Conference specifically, a lot of our members, they represent districts that are separated by um, many kilometers of, um, cross of proximity. So you have um, a constituent who might be um, very far away from another. So to reach those populations that are, um, that are slightly uninhabited, social media comes in handy all the time. Um, and you should think of, a, of social media as a two-way interaction as well as a um, networked interaction. So this is a feedback loop. So you are able to engage with constituents and citizens in a way that you wouldn't ultimately be able to do so otherwise. Um, so when developing a social media strategy, um, you need to, likewise, um, with your media strategy, identify your goals and what is it that you want to be and communicating to your constituents. Another um, important element of social media is developing a brand, um, just as you would with, um, within marketing. Um, what it is you're going to be talking about and how you're going to discuss these things. Um, ensuring that the image that you're presenting relates to your professional or personal experience and that you're accurately reflecting these um, goals. So every element of your profile, your photo, your header, your biography, should reflect your orga organization's identity and your personality. So members of Congress will, should be using the same fonts, colors, headers, logos, um, and any externally facing email, op-ed, website, or on social media, just as, um, because this product familiarity um, also builds trust. Um, another important thing is um, when utilizing social media is um, to identify which platforms you should be utilizing. So social media is something that is always evolving and changing and um, there are many platforms um, that you can be utilizing in your strategy. So you need to understand um, what these platforms do, who your citizens um, are, and, they, and what which platforms they're already on and you need to meet them there. So um, if you're trying to reach a, a certain gender, age range, um, certain population, they're going to be using different um, social media platforms than um, their counterparts. So it's very important to be identifying um, who it is you want to talk to and talking to them in the topics that they're using. Um, when implementing your social media, it's important to create a content calendar and um, whenever you're creating your original content. Um, you must think of your constituents as you would any kind of relationship and that's one that should be nurtured. Um, this involves creating um, a lot of content that is being regularly produced um, and you're talking to these people very often. So um, one good quick trick is to create calendar anchors. And what that is is if you know that there is um, an event coming up that is important to the folks that you're wanting to talk to, that you're creating content surrounding that and um, you're posting it at appropriate times. Um, another good thing to be incorporating is scheduling your posts and making sure that they're going out whenever um, your constituents will, and your citizens will be reading them. So um, the best way to achieve these goals is um, you know, asking yourself a couple of questions. So do you have um, staff members who can be monitoring your social media and your, and your in media presence in general? Um, do you have a team that can help develop this? How involved do you or does your uh, member of Congress want to personally be in, um, in posting and creating this content? And what will the approval process be like? Um, the approval process is uh, very important to make sure that everything sounds um, like it's coming from the same person and that's reflecting your, um, your mission and your goals accurately. It sounds like it is coming from um, the, your boss, your member of Congress, your department, whoever it is that the voice that you're trying to um, match is coming from. So I've included a couple of tips for utilizing social media. Um, be consistent in the quality and types of posts you create. Pair the text with photos or videos when possible. And um, target your posts. So depending on your goals, you may want to post something that will interest people of specific ages and genders, um, 
or different demographics. Um, boosting your posts is something that you can do through Facebook that I would utilize um, creating um, even, I don't know if it's um, permissible or what some of your, um, your guidelines are, but creating a budget to um, be creating this content and boosting your posts is something that we do and I would also suggest that you do as well. Um, and another thing is to be responding to the comments to your posts. This is the feedback loop that I mentioned. So um, in the States, this is a great way to understand what it is our constituents and our citizens are caring about. So if they um, are wanting certain um, legislative priorities to be pushed, if they are unhappy, if there's a problem with their roads, with um, whatever it may be in their society, it's um, it's engaging these folks and making sure that their voices are being heard. Um, the most successful way to engage your constituents is to strike a balance between education and entertainment. So this is um, explaining what it is that we're doing, explaining um, and communicating the process and what it is that's going on here in Lima, as well as creating, um, what we try to do is create posts that will entertain people, so people coming back and it's, Less, um, you know, think of social media that you follow and why you follow it and trying to engage citizens in creative and um, unconventional ways. Um, so, one thing that I will also suggest doing is to be constantly reviewing what is working and what is not working. There are free platform analytic processes that you can um, utilize to. Um, review your post performance um, to understand your peak audience engagement periods of time that are more effective than others. And this will identify how often you should be posting content, what kind of content you're creating, and how successful um, you're being. You can even test um, certain messages um, saying the same thing, but in different ways to see what is being um, understood by and resonating with your citizens. Um, another thing to note is that social media is a great tool for crisis management. Um, it is the fastest way to uh, reach your constituents. You're not writing a letter and, um, on something that's happening in real time and mailing it out and hoping it gets to them within the week. You're saying, this is happening now. Um, for us, we, um, we this past fall in eastern Washington, there were a lot of fires that were going on um, within our district, and so it, it, uh, it's very wooded, there's a lot of trees, and so it was being able to talk about this natural disaster in real time, which we found to be um, very successful and, and made um, our citizens feel like we were doing our best to take care of them, um, even though we might be um, thousands of kilometers away. Um, social media will allow you to get in front of an issue also if you're, um, say that there's some controversial legislation that's coming up, um, it will allow you to, um, to tell your story quickly before someone else tells your story for you. Um, so it is a great tool in those circumstances. And next slide please. Um, so. I'm going to have you, this is a video, I'm going to have you press play after I um, give an explanation. Um, one moment though. Okay. Um, so yesterday someone asked a question pertaining to the relationship between members of Congress and their constituency. Um, this relationship involves making you know, legislative um, decisions that impact their lives. Um, being in the community and communicating those two things. So um, I wanted to include an example of a communications effort that we use to connect members with their constituencies in, in order to better build, build this relationship. For us, we, um, we oftentimes in the U.S., um, a lot of our members of Congress fall prey to, once they become a member of Congress, um, folks within their districts think that they have become um, part of the establishment. They have become to Washington, D.C. and have forgotten where they come from. So we um, created this video strategy in order to um, best art articulate um, who the member of Congress is, show the um, show his constituencies that he hasn't 
really changed. He's who they elected and sent to Washington, D.C., and he's essentially one of them. This is Carlos Cabello from South Florida. His, um, his citizens are um, Cuban Americans, just as he is, and um, we developed um, videos like this for a lot of uh, members of Congress, and I can talk about it more in depth afterwards, but to just give a, a slice of life of their personality, which we found to be very effective in doing so. Um, and we can press buttons as you So I always remember as a child, uh, kind of the uh, the background of my life was uh, a Cuban radio station. Cubans were always, um, especially older generations, uh, very attuned to what was happening in Cuba because there was always that hope. That was also a very um, rich theme uh, in my childhood and adolescence, just that waiting. Carlos Cabello. And I grew up in a uh, working class neighborhood. My dad is from Havana. He came uh, without his parents because his father wasn't serving as a local prison sentence. And his mother was in Cuba hoping to get uh, his father, my grandfather, out. Uh, and my maternal grandmother, uh, who is still alive, she is 93, uh, has really lived her whole life uh, for us. My family and many Cuban families were very happy in their country. It was a flawed country, but uh, most of them uh, wanted uh, Cuba to remain their home, but they, uh, they had to leave. I remember every day uh, I would walk home with my grandmother's sister. She would ask me if I learned um, studying at the end. She would always say, remember that uh, people can take everything from you. And then she would say, the only thing they can never take from you is what you know, is your education. So that also means that we grew up with this profound appreciation for freedom. Because in the United States, a lot of times we say, well, freedom is fragile and, and we lose it all. Uh, but Cubans actually went through that experience. This country, uh, I will always be so grateful uh, for it having given uh, my grandparents and my parents a home uh, when they, quite frankly, had lost everything. Uh, that's what a refugee is, an exile, someone that is displaced uh, involuntarily. It's a very lively culture. Even people who have gone through a very difficult life experience dig in deep and find that desire to dance and to celebrate life. So that's an example of some of the digital content that we created um, for this member and for other members so that they can take that, tell their story, connect with their constituents. We can put it on social media, we can pitch it to local um, news affiliates, and we can control the narrative of who this member of Congress is without, especially his opponents, the other side, the other political party, other folks telling him his story for him. So, um, these um, are in English, and I apologize for that, so I can read them out to you. But um, these are some questions that I challenge you to ask yourself whenever you're thinking about um, your own social media strategy. So, important questions to ask are, what kind of social media platform should you use? Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, etc. What are your goals? What effects, are, what effects do you plan to achieve with your social media account? Who is the audience, your citizens, that you're trying to reach and why? Do you need a personal public figure or an organization page? And how can you effectively manage your social media? So that being said, I appreciate your attention and um, for more from those questions or if you'd like to strategize um, something that would be effective and useful in your capacity, I would love the opportunity to do
realidad la exposición que usted nos ha hecho eh, supone el uso de los medios de comunicación y de las redes sociales como un aliado para transmitir el mensaje de los congresistas. Desde una perspectiva partidaria, desde la bancada republicana, que es para la que usted trabaja. Quizás acá en el Perú tenemos eh, algunos problemas previos, digamos, que sería bueno discutir. Una primera, en mi punto de vista muy personal, es si los parlamentarios en realidad tienen una conciencia sobre ser representantes de estos electores y ciudadanos y qué es lo que significa. Eh, qué es lo que significa no solamente en términos de transmitir un mensaje, sino también en términos de ser conscientes de que ellos los han puesto en el Parlamento y por lo tanto tienen obligación de ser transparentes, serios y rendir cuentas de sus actos y opiniones. Me gustaría saber cómo abordan ustedes ese tema de fondo que está incluso para poder saber qué tipo de mensaje debe transmitirse. Y un segundo problema que tenemos aquí es que los medios de comunicación no solamente eh, son un medio para llegar al ciudadano, sino bueno, desde hace algunas décadas incluso, eh, también han servido en cierto modo, en mi punto de vista también, para... Eh, expresar algunos intereses de la sociedad, de sectores de la sociedad o del país, a quienes les interesa tener un Congreso no necesariamente fuerte, sino más bien débil. ¿no? Y muchas veces los medios de prensa o los medios de comunicación no necesariamente son aliados para transmitir lo que el Congreso hace objetivamente, sino para poner el foco en eh, los errores, escándalos o dificultades eh, que puedan haber en el Parlamento. Hay dos maneras de responder a eso. Una es transparentando todo lo posible la gestión y la información parlamentaria y por lo tanto mostrar al ciudadano con claridad todo lo que se hace y dejar poco espacio para la manipulación. Y hay otra manera que es más bien poner las normas del secreto, entre comillas, sobre muchas áreas que son preocupantes para el ciudadano y por lo tanto cuando algún periodista o algún medio de prensa interesadamente distorsiona alguna información, bueno, se genera un gran escándalo que termina debilitando al Congreso. En su calidad de comunicadora me gustaría conocer su opinión al respecto. Well, um, I will say technology changes very fast, whereas changing minds oftentimes changes, change very slowly. Um, you know, in America, we, we do have a similar problem um, to some degree. Um, one of the problems to address, I think, one of your questions is that for us, getting, um, as we mentioned yesterday, a lot of our members of Congress are are much older. They are not as um, well acquainted with social media and technology and the usefulness of it. And so it was a very, it was a very hard challenge to get um, our members on board with 
with these advances and these pursuits. This is where the world is going. So if you want to, we had to convince our members of Congress that if you want to reach your constituency, therefore if you want to be reelected, you're going to have to, you're going to have to change the way you do things. So we call that a change of culture, which is also very challenging. What we found to be effective in doing so was to find one or two people, one or two members of Congress, and selling them our idea of saying, you need to get on Facebook, you need to be creating these videos, you need to be doing, doing it the way that we're telling you to do it if you want to see it work because you're not going to be here if you don't. And what happened was they saw great success. And then as their colleagues, as the other members of Congress saw this success and they said, I want what he wants or what he has. And so as it, it was a slow process, but we were able to get there. Um, you know, it sounds like you also have a media bias. Um, we have a media bias in America as well. Um, to a different degree, we have our different issues, but it is something that um, that Republicans and Democrats both face in their own ways, and that members of Congress, Washington, D.C., definitely experiences as a whole. So, um, we do two things to combat this media bias. One is we um, utilize these social media um, platforms to tell our story because that is the only way that we are able to own and um, have complete control of whatever it is we're trying to articulate. And so, um, you know, that being said, as we are circumventing the media, we're able to change minds in that way. Um, another another tactful um, way of going about it is, as I mentioned earlier, um, creating these relationships with the media in a way that with with people of interest that we trust and, and identifying who those people are. And that's a challenge. It's, it takes a, a full-time staffer in our circumstance to identify these people and know that, that these um, point people within the media are going to spin our story in a way that we don't want. We also have the benefit of utilizing certain networks that we know um, will work in our favor. I don't know if you have a similar situation um, in Peru or Lima, but um, you know there are television uh, networks that we will only use again because we know that we are going to get the outcome, get the story that we want to be using. Um, and I believe that covers all of your questions, but please let me know if I can clarify or um, address the thing. ¿verdad? Muchas gracias, está muy buena la exposición, muy didáctica. Mi pregunta es muy puntual. He visto que ustedes, y en, en, en Estados Unidos mucho se aplica en comunicación, el, el storytelling, digamos, para, para a través de testimonios se pueda este, sensibilizar y transmitir un mensaje muy directo. Y, y esto va relacionado con el formato. En Perú, ha habido estudios sobre usabilidad de los smartphones, la internet y los segmentos de la población respecto a esto. ¿Qué tan importante es un formato visual, audiovisual en, red, en redes sociales en lugar de una publicación textual ¿no? que pueda incidir en el ciudadano que a veces no tiene mucho tiempo y tiene que conectarse rápido con el mensaje. Great question. A hundred percent. You are going to always see um, more beneficial um, impact and reach whenever you're incorporating these visual aids with um, your your text. Um, text alone it doesn't penetrate. Um, you know, as you know, we are all inundated with so much information. And text alone is hard for folks to. Um, it doesn't resonate as well. Um, so I would always, you know, suggest video. Video. And our studies have shown how perform the best. They resonate with folks the best. And then photos. And then if you can couple um, text with photo, that's you're going to see a, a lot better results. And um, one thing specifically to also note is that. 
faces have been shown to also resonate best with people. So um, anytime you're able to be using these visual aids, I definitely encourage you to do so. En, nuestro, en nuestro país, digamos, este, los congresistas eh, en sus mismos despachos tienen un equipo de personas que manejan sus estrategias de comunicación, sus medios de, de comunicación. Ahora, este, a lo largo de todos estos años, digamos, como que, digamos, eh, las personas que brindan un poco de soporte a esto, desde el punto de vista tecnológico, vemos que, que los resultados son un poco bajos, ¿no? por el hecho un poco de lo que tú mencionabas del uso de la tecnología ¿no? entonces a veces los congresistas y sus asesores no manejan el concepto de estrategias, de medios sociales etcétera y eso como que no da miedo entonces según como yo lo veo eh, en, lo, en el sitio donde tú te encuentras ustedes como que se han dado cuenta de eso ¿no? y la misma cámara de digamos, representantes de los de, de, digamos, republicanos han formado pues una unidad que, que es que usted maneja, que lo que trata es, digamos, de armar estrategias de comunicación para que los miembros de su partido la utilicen. Veo que realmente eso tiene, es bastante interesante, ¿no? Algo que podría ser implementado acá, ya que, digamos, a nivel de los despachos, como que eso es un poco débil, este, manejarlo tal vez un nivel un poco más arriba a nivel de los grupos parlamentarios, etc. No sé realmente quién sería, ¿no? La pregunta es si el Congreso, digamos, americano, brinda algún tipo de soporte a tu, a, a tu oficina con relación al uso de la tecnología, o sea, o es que ustedes, digamos, las arreglan con su equipo de soporte ¿no? para brindar armar estas, est digamos, est estas estrategias. Y la segunda pregunta es si los congresistas, digamos, hacen suyas las estrategias y las tecnologías y los soportes que ustedes, digamos, brindan, o si ellos tienen, a diferencia de nuestro caso, soporte tecnológico para manejar sus estrategias de medios. Y en esos casos, digamos, ya no utilizarían las estrategias de medios que usted, como, digamos, dirección, digamos, ya te propone. Este, muchas gracias. Great question. So, one thing to note is that there is, um, there's a, a very distinct difference in, within technology as far as hardware goes and strategy goes. You have very, very, two very different things. So, Um, the folks who are taking care of our computers, who are making sure our email works, who are working on the hardware, those are people, those are not communicators in the way that they're not writing on the, they're not writing emails, they're not creating our social media, they're not developing a strategy. So that's just something that I do want to um, differentiate. Um, the, so the staff, um, so as we mentioned yesterday, every personal office has a communications person. And that communications person, um, they develop their communication strategy however they see best to reach their, their constituents. But at the same time, they're all using social media. And oftentimes, um, what we have done to, um, and we found very useful is we hire very young people to come in and say, come handle our Facebook account. We'll have a communicator, a comms director, who understands more sophisticated branding, marketing strategy, communication strategy, and theory, who can um, who can teach the, um, the young person how to be talking about um, what it is we're doing. But at the end of the day, it's these young people that we're bringing in who understand how to talk to their peers and who we would like to be Reaching. We, we utilize their knowledge that they, you know, you have to understand. Think about um, these 22-year-olds who were using social media since they were children. They're they're the experts on this. And so I would, um, I don't know the, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with the average age of some of your office staff, but um, if you're not utilizing, um, you know, kind of these, these young millennials, um, this is a great opportunity to do so. Um, the congressmen, um, So they, 
they vary on their usage of social media, which from someone who has to organize um, all of the messaging for 300 members of Congress, 245 members of Congress, it, um, that can be very scary because at the end of the day, as you've seen um, within our presentations, um, our congressional offices and our members of Congress are incredibly reliant on their staff for expertise. So sometimes um, our members of Congress will want to get on Facebook, want to get on Twitter, and not know the most strategic ways to be doing so. But it's our job to be um, still incorporating their vision in a way that we understand makes sense along with policy and transparency and um, making sure that we're all rowing in the same direction. So um, every every member of Congress has, um, we, you know, it, it's up to them, but a lot of them don't even have the time to be doing, because this all takes so much time to be doing the analytics, to be creating content that is effective. And um, at the end of the day, what we like to do all the time is have our strategy laid out and then um, write it in a way that sounds like it's coming from the member of Congress. So that way, whenever the member does want to speak for themselves, they have the opportunity to do so and it fits within the narrative that sounds like it's coming from the New York Congress's voice. So um, it's a case-by-case -case basis, but that, in my opinion, is the, um, the best model of incorporating the member. Muchas gracias. Eh, tengan todos ustedes muy buenos días. Un cordial saludo y una grata bienvenida a Scott, que es un amigo del Departamento de Investigación y Documentación Parlamentaria, a la delegación que nos honra con su visita y, cómo no, agradecer al Centro de Capacitación y Estudios Parlamentarios, a la House Democracy Partnership, al Instituto Republicano eh, Internacional, que no es la primera vez que el Departamento de Investigación y Documentación Parlamentaria eh, trabaja de manera coordinada, siempre estamos prestos a apoyar. En esta oportunidad eh, se nos ha convocado para hacer una presentación sobre los sistemas de información aplicados específicamente al procedimiento legislativo. Pero previamente, a modo de presentación, eh, me gustaría eh, mostrarles el siguiente video institucional. El Departamento de Investigación y Documentación Parlamentaria del Congreso de la República te saluda. Nosotros somos un órgano de línea de la Dirección General Parlamentaria, enfocado en brindar información técnica requerida por las actividades congresales y proveemos información e investigación especializada. Nuestros productos están actualizados y sistematizados en línea para facilitar su acceso. Contamos con información para el apoyo legislativo, expedientes, traducciones, carpetas temáticas, entre otros. Visítanos en nuestra web y conoce más sobre nosotros. Somos el Departamento de Investigación y Documentación Parlamentaria. Información al servicio del país. a mis compañeros, eh, a mis colegas del Parlamento que pueden eh, ver la presentación que voy a hacer está en español y la cuentan en versión impresa en una deferencia con los visitantes, con los funcionarios que nos acompañan la presentación que van a ver en pantalla es en inglés ¿Le avanzamos por favor algo? Ayer la, mi colega, la jefa del departamento de comisiones, explicaba lo que era el procedimiento legislativo. Yo se los presento en un pantallazo, eh, brevemente tenemos desde un proponente, eh, que bien saben que puede ser desde el presidente de la república, eh, los grupos parlamentarios que presentan, son los que presentan la iniciativa legislativa, iniciativa legislativa que va a una o dos comisiones, Posteriormente, eh, las comisiones estudian y dictaminan esta iniciativa legislativa y pasa a, a, la, a la tercera esfera, que es el Consejo Directivo. El Consejo Directivo es el que elabora la agenda del Pleno y los dictámenes que recibe de las comisiones lo deriva al Pleno. Finalmente, el Pleno debate y aprueba la, los dictámenes de las comisiones y son enviados al Presidente de la República para su promulgación. 
alumna diapositiva más? Esos son los instrumentos normativos, los documentos procesales que se generan en estas distintas etapas. Esto como un, a modo de, una, de un pantallazo de lo que tenemos en el caso peruano como un procedimiento legislativo ordinario. Una diapositiva, por favor. ¿Dónde entran los sistemas de información? Yo, exacto, lo estaba advirtiendo, es como una suerte de PACMA. Ahorita lo vamos a explicar por qué. Eh, los sistemas de información se pueden definir técnicamente como un conjunto de componentes relacionados que recolectan, recuperan, procesan, almacenan y distribuyen información. Eh, la oficina de trámite documentario que si bien es cierto no depende del Departamento de Investigación y Documentación Parlamentaria, entre otras oficinas, es un aliado nuestro porque son los que tienen a cargo la mesa de partes. La mesa de partes que va por, la que va, por la que se van a recibir todos estos documentos, desde el proyecto de ley, de los dictámenes, en la oficina de trámite documentario los va a registrar. ¿Dónde entra la gestión de la información? en cuanto al, al DIC, en cuanto al Departamento de Investigación y Documentación Parlamentaria, en las distintas etapas. En las distintas etapas va a recolectar, a registrar esta información y la va a almacenar y la va a procesar. Una más. De lo que procesa, de lo que recibe el Departamento de Investigación, se construye lo que son los expedientes virtuales de proyectos de ley. Los expedientes virtuales de, de proyectos de ley van a, ir, van a generar información, eh, van a generar, van a, van a, a, a generar y los distintos este, los, los tres, los tres este, sistemas que vamos a explicar a continuación. Pero antes me detengo un momento en lo que es la elaboración en sí de los expedientes virtuales de proyectos de ley que está a cargo de una de las áreas del Departamento de Investigación y Documentación Parlamentaria que es el área de servicios documentales y de información la elaboración de los expedientes virtuales de proyectos de ley cuenta con la elaboración cuenta con la certificación ISO 9001-2008 y esto es bueno mencionarlo porque no se trata de registrar, de digitalizar es toda una gestión documental que se hace para poder tener un proyecto de ley debidamente digitalizado que mañana pasado eh, va a poder ser eh, visto con, con alta calidad y con otras ventajas que vamos a ir explicando a continuación. Eh, los expedientes virtuales de proyectos de ley van a generar lo que son como sistema de información, el sistema de trámite documentario, eh, la agenda documentada y el archivo digital de la legislación del PIB. Empezamos por el primero, el sistema de trámite documentario, que también es conocido como el sistema de seguimiento de proyectos de ley. Es un sistema que a partir del registro, por eso les hacía la explicación breve de lo que es el procedimiento legislativo, cuando la iniciativa legislativa llega a partir de la presentación de un proponente, la registra eh, trámite documentario y el DIC crea, elabora un expediente de proyecto de ley al cual ustedes eh, pueden ver eh, cómo ubicarlo a través de nuestra página web. Es más o menos, eh, esta parte es más o menos similar a lo que, a lo que ya se explicaba ayer en su, en su exposición. Eh, no sé si es el caso de Estados Unidos, en todo caso lo, lo, lo planteo como una pregunta posterior. Eh, en el caso de Perú, contamos con un acceso a través de un aplicativo móvil, que es el que aparece al costado. Eh, el aplicativo móvil... Eh, por el cual uno puede acceder libremente y consultar estos expedientes de proyectos de ley. Tanto del periodo pasado, del periodo 2011-2016 y el 2016-2021, que es una labor que hay que reconocer que lo ha hecho la Oficina de Tecnología de Información del Congreso de la República. Una vez que uno accede a determinado expediente, esta consulta que hice es del proyecto de ley 1043, si es que la vista no me falla. Uno accede al expediente, de, al, al, al registro de trámite documentario y visualiza eh, en versión PDF el proyecto de ley como el punto de partida, de nacimiento de lo que va a convertirse esta historia legislativa. 
Luego tenemos lo que se llama la agenda documentada. Eh, a partir de, de, de las sesiones que, se, que convocan eh, para las sesiones plenarias, eh, el Congreso de la República, los señores congresistas se manejan con esta agenda. Esta es la agenda, me permitió sacarle una copia a la agenda del pasado jueves 9 de marzo. Eh, se distribuye a los señores congresistas, a los asesores, a los grupos parlamentarios, al lo, personal de prensa, eh, previo al inicio de cada sesión y con esto eh, lo, los señores congresistas se, seguían, ¿no? Pero, ¿qué ocurre? Que eh, nosotros estamos, hemos ya procesado esta información y construido una agenda documentada. Una agenda documentada que es publicada en el portal institucional, que es difundida a los correos electrónicos de los señores congresistas y a la cual uno puede acceder libremente a cualquiera de los puntos que son materia de agenda. Uno más. Exactamente a todos. Por ejemplo, le mostraba, esta es la agenda del pleno del jueves 9 de marzo y la que ven en pantalla es de la misma fecha, con todos los hipervínculos respecto a los temas. El que aparece en pantalla es el punto 7, que se vio en esa sesión, un tema de una propuesta de simplificación administrativa y promoción de la inversión minera. Y uno puede acceder a todos los documentos, obviamente siempre el punto de partida, la partida de nacimiento va a ser un proyecto de ley. Tenemos los dictámenes, los acuerdos. Ayer una compañera, una secretaria técnica, eh, explicaba estos acuerdos que se dan en nuestro caso en el Congreso peruano de los que da la Junta de Portavoces. Este proyecto de ley recibió este acuerdo de Junta de Portavoces y cualquiera lo puede consultar para ver en qué sentido se dio. En este caso, eh, este proyecto de ley fue a dos comisiones, solo contaba con el dictamen de una y la Junta de Portavoces eh, soneró del dictamen de la segunda comisión. Toda esta documentación es pública, toda esta documentación uno puede acceder. Yo les decía hace un momento que tomé el trabajo de sacar una copia de esta agenda del Pleno, que es la que se distribuye en físico, que consta de 42 páginas. Eh, 42 páginas y solamente en la sección de dictámenes tiene 35 temas legislativos. 35 proyectos, 35 dictámenes, imagínense aquellos, aquellos, aquellos proyectos que han sido más de un dictamen y si hacemos el ejercicio, en todo caso se lo dejo de tarea, de cuánto papel significa esto. Eh, como lo mencionaba hace un momento eh, eh, Victoria en su explicación que tiene que ver con el tema de, de menos papel, esta herramienta no tiene, tiene como finalidad, además de, de simplificar el acceso a los documentos, eh, convertirse en una medida de coeficiencia. ¿no? Tenemos finalmente como punto 3 eh, lo que es el archivo digital de la legislación del Perú. El archivo digital de la legislación del Perú es una plataforma a la cual uno puede acceder a, a todas las leyes a partir de 1904 hasta la fecha. Eh, y esta, esta consulta la pueden hacer por el número de la norma, por una palabra clave o por la fecha de publicación. Finalmente, eh, habiendo pasado por el sistema de trámite documentario como lo que fue un proyecto de ley, pasando por lo que fue la agenda documentada, y llegando a convertirse en una ley, eh, si lo recuerdan, es como los ciclos del proceso legislativo. En este archivo digital ya tenemos el último documento, que es la ley promulgada. Eh, en este caso, eh, escogí la ley de presupuesto de, de este año, y lo hice a propósito de la consulta que hizo ayer Justin, cuando Justin preguntaba si el proyecto de ley que presentaba el, el, el Poder Ejecutivo era tal cual se aprobaba en el Congreso de la República y si uno es un ciudadano que quiere comprobarlo, puede a través de esta plataforma ver 
el proyecto, conocer el proyecto de ley del presupuesto y conocer finalmente, habiendo pasado por distintos documentos que han dado origen al estudio y debate y aprobación, y ver cómo quedó finalmente la ley. Y cuando menciono los documentos por los que se ha pasado, hay que resaltar algo, las votaciones. En todos los casos de las leyes, estos expedientes consideran a, la, a las votaciones. Esto, los expedientes en sí, como lo mencionaba, vuelvo a la imagen de todas las etapas que pasan en las que intervienen distintas oficinas del Congreso de la República y que proveen información, información que se recolecta para elaborar estos expedientes virtuales, las votaciones y las autógrafas, la gestión, la oficina de relatoría donde alguna vez trabajé y finalmente eh, son incluidas en el expediente correspondiente. La sexta estrategia de aplicación. Esto, esto es importante mencionarlo porque el Departamento de Investigación y Documentación Parlamentaria también tiene a su cargo el área de archivo y poco a poco los ciudadanos se han ido familiarizando con herramientas como estas para, a, para a las solicitudes de las votaciones porque antes recibíamos documentos, eh, solicitudes de personas que son, están alejadas a, 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 a la ciudad de Lima solicitando acceder a estos documentos 